Much love and respect. Buddha vida, mi gente. Thanks for tuning in once again. Today we're just going to continue uh, reading from this book we've been reading from regarding ancient America. So the book again is Mysteries of Ancient America, Uncovering the Forbidden by Fritz Zimmerman. And I told you guys we will come back to this book and read the next parts of it. Uh, this one is called Ireland's for Maurian king and queen buried in the Grave Creek Mountain, West Virginia. Remember the Formorians are these giant people that ended up in Ireland. A lot of people associate them with Hamites. They're definitely considered to be of a dark race, considered to be so-called Negro. And many people try to make them African because of that. But where's the true holy land? Let's see what this chapter is talking about. We're going to pull out the babies and, uh, of course, touch the hijack, right? And uh, so we're going to talk about this picture right here. You see this mound right here in the houses. This is an old picture. Earliest known photograph of the Grave Creek Mound with visible scars from early excavations. Originally, the lower tomb containing the eight-foot giant was able to be viewed for a few cents. A cave-in ended the attraction. The Grave Creek Burial Mount, located in Moundsville, West Virginia, is the largest and most famous in the Ohio Valley. The mound measures 69 feet in height, with a diameter of almost 300 feet. It was surrounded by a moat of 40 feet in width and 5 feet in depth, with a single causeway that led to the mound. Engineers estimate that it required its builders to move more than 60,000 tons of earth. That's 24 million baskets of earth at five pounds per basket. This begs the question of who warranted such an effort. In 1838, an archeological excavation of the Grave Creek Mount led by Jesse and Aberlatt Tomlinson uncovered the ruins of two large vaults, one situated directly below the other. The vaults contained several human skeletons and a considerable amount of jewelry and other artifacts. According to Henry Rose Coolcraft, who visited the site in 1843, the Grave Creek Stone was discovered in the upper vault along with 1,700 beads, 500 seashells, 5 copper bracelets, and 150 plates of mica. Alright, now we've talked about the Grave Creek Stone a lot. It has Paleo-Hebrew inscriptions on it. They found this, again, in Ohio, in a mound, guys, the Grave Creek Mound. The Grave Creek Tablet was a small flat stone of an ovate shape containing an inscription of an unknown characters. More detailed descriptions of the skeletons was featured in the Charleston Daily Mail, October 22, 1922. Archaeologists investigating the mound some years ago dug out a skeleton said to be that of a female because of the formation of the bones. The skeleton was seven feet, four inches tall and jawbone would easily fit over the face of a man weighing 160 pounds. There was also taken from the mound the skeleton of a man eight feet tall. There were no ornaments beside it. These skeletons were sent to the Smithsonian Institution in Washington. All right, and you know what they did with it. These people, all they do is hide stuff and rewrite the narratives. So this is an image of the uh, Grave Creek Stone or Tablet, as you guys can see. Again, Paleo-Hebrew. The Grave Creek Stone was found laying in the tomb of 
the queen, who exceeded seven feet in height. Dr. Barry Fell observed that Tarshish script was no more than a dialectal variant of Canaanite Phoenician. All right, Phoenician, so-called Paleo-Hebrew. The fact that Tarshish spoke a dialect of the Phoenician language clearly shows that it was a Semitic colony of the Phoenician Empire. The language of this Phoenician colony in ancient Spain eventually came to be known as Iberian Punic. That's what is in this stone they found in Ohio in the mount, guys, next to a seven-foot queen. The Punic language, also called Carthaginian, is an extinct variety of the Canaanite language of the Semitic family, all right? And it's supposed to be extinct. This is old. It was spoken in the Carthaginian Empire in North Africa and several Mediterranean islands by the Punic people throughout classical antiquity from the 8th century BC to the 5th century AD. The Punic stayed in contact with Phoenicia until the destruction of Carthage by the Romans in 146 BC. The date of construction of the Grave Creek Mound is between 250 to 150 BC. Barry Fell, in America, BC, all right, the book that we have read and we're going to continue to read great book from 1976 stating that the script found in the Grave Creek Mound is Iberian and the language Punic and translated it as the mound raised on high for Tasak. This title, his queen, caused to be made. It almost sounds like Isaac. Isaac. The queen raised the mound over her husband, King Tasak. Later, she would later be placed in the upper vault. There is also evidence that this mound site was a mass grave and that hundreds or thousands were cremated above the lower tomb of the king. Adena type mounds were usually built in stages. In this case, the lower tomb may have been constructed. And then a series of carnal houses placed on top where cremations of skeletons were executed. The following observation is also quoted from Charleston Daily Mail, October 22, 1922. One interesting feature of the excavating was the formation of the ground composing the mound. It resembled the surrounding soil and was sandy until a depth of about 8 feet was reached when blue spots were noticed. These increased upon approach to the center until they were so closely laid as to give the soil a clouded appearance. Examination showed that the spots contained bits of bone and ashes, which led the investigators to the belief that the entire mound had been built of cremated bodies, which builders piled about him upon the vault of the chief and his queen. Do you guys hear that? Wow. This is what they're finding based on the excavation. Two large skeletons and a Carthaginian tablet provides more evidence that the Adena were the same giant tribes of Amorites spoken of in the Bible. All right, he's saying, hey, these are the Amorites. In Irish history, there is a mythical giant people called the Formorians. This name has its etymological root with the Muru or Amorites in the Bible. The Formorians were said to be sea pirates based out Carthage. All right, so where is Carthage if they came from here? It is possible that after Rome destroyed Carthage, the Formorians sailed to North America, or maybe uh, you're seeing it in reverse, huh? There is a physical oddity that ties all of this together. First, the Formorians were said not only be giants, but many had double rows of teeth. One of these giants was described by Chris Grooms in the Giants of Wales, Carthage, North Africa. And in the time of Hadrian the Emperor, 117 BC to 138 BC, there was raised from the earth in a place called Messana, the body of the giant called Ida, who was 20 feet, probably not that tall, in length, and who had double sets of teeth or two rows of teeth still standing completely preserved in his head or gums. The Babylonian Talmud, a Jewish sacred book, refers to a giant possessing the same twin sets of dentures in ancient Israel. For those that have the encyclopedia, you know how many giants were described with double rows of teeth in North America and the Ohio Valley, all right? So again, yeah, that's a common story that, you know, these giants, a lot of them had supposedly double sets of teeth uh, and six fingers, six toes, right? The Canaanites, Amorites, were known for their genius in commerce and industry. 
which gave them the courage to brave the wild seas and ventures into distant lands. These distant lands would eventually become a last these distant lands would eventually become a last bastion for those displaced by emerging powers in the Mediterranean. While we may never know if the Grave Creek Stone was a hoax, its origins with its Semitic people known for their large size, double rows of teeth and engaged in seafaring traits seems to be quite a coincidence. Huh? He makes a point there. All right, so that was that chapter of uh, this book again, talking about not only the Grave Creek Stone, which we have uh, talked about, but but who they were found with. These giants, right? What we would consider giants, you know, but they were eight feet, the male, and seven feet, the woman. So for somebody who's 5'5", five, five, you know, that's pretty tall. But many basketball players, right, are seven feet tall. Either way, very interesting. We're going to go into a bonus video now. And we're going to continue talking about the Grave Creek Stone, right? So just corroborate. All right, going to read from uh, this book now. All right, so back in the book is called Archives of Aboriginal Knowledge Containing All the Original Papers Laid Before Congress Respecting the History, Antiquities, Language, Ethnology, Pictography, Rights, Superstitions, and Mythology of the Indian Tribes of the United States by Henry R. Schoolcraft, LLD. This is volume one out of six, right? This is from 1860. And I go to page 124 of this book, down at the bottom uh, paragraph. Notice of an inscription and in antique characters found on a tabular stone or amulet in one of the Western tumuli of probably the beginning of the 16th century. The discovery of an inscription in a large tumulus near Wheeling in Western Virginia gives an importance to the opening of that mound, which it would not otherwise possess. This archaeological discovery was made, as Mr. Aberland Tomlinson, the proprietor states, vied Western pioneer, on the 16th of June, 1838, the country had then been settled 57 years and had been first explored two years earlier. Mr. Jesse Tomlinson, the original proprietor and uncle of Abelard, had carefully guarded it and prevented any excavations from being made or any of the forest trees with which it was covered from being cut. He yielded at length to the public curiosity to explore its contents. When his nephew, Aberland Tomlinson, entered into an arrangement with some other persons to execute the work on a fixed plan of excavation, they ran a horizontal gallery into its center and sunk a shaft from its top to intersect this audit as represented in plate 12, figure one. Some of the things they found here in this mound. Okay. Continuing, it says, to penetrate a tumulus of earth of 333 feet in circumference and 70 feet in height with an unbroken surface bearing large trees was not a light work, and it appears that the labor of several hands for a number of months was required. The results which had been recorded in the pages of the American Pioneer, volume 2D, page 197, were the discovery of two root tombs containing skeletons and a number of beads, amulets, and shells, but nothing indicative of an unusual civilization in the builders of this tumulus, except the inscription stone. Even if the block prints, discoidal stones, siphons of steatite, and watchtowers hereafter to be noticed, be taught to denote a higher state of wants than the Indian tribes had, they were not the ones of high civilization. Little or no importance appears to have been attached to the inscription for several years. The men engaged in the work were no archaeologists. It was supposed to be in Indian characters, and they are called hieroglyphics by Mr. Townsend, a writer who described the opening of the mound in a letter, which was published in the Cincinnati Chronicle, a weekly cassette. Of February 2nd, 1839. He also gave a drawing of the inscription. A copy of this paper was transmitted to me by a friend, having at the same time a copy of Mr. March's grammar of the Icelandic of 1838, the appendix to which contains the runic alphabet. I observed some corresponding characters. He's saying he saw some runic uh, characters from Iceland that match 
the Grave Creek tablet they found there in West Virginia. I remember what we're reading. This is a very scholarly book by reference to an inscription from Dr. Plot's history of Staffordshire. It was also seen that there were several of the characters quite identical with the ancient form of the Celtic alphabet. Okay, Celtic. Grave Creek Stone in West Virginia, a tablet they found there in this mound, all right, has runic Celtic characters, all right, but they're looking at the original. As employed in Britain in the so-called stick book, just like the ones in the stick book. A copy of the inscription, Townsend's copy, was transmitted to Professor Raffin at Copenhagen, the distinguished secretary of the Royal Society of Northern Antiquaries. Mr. Raffin does not find it to be runic, but is disposed to consider the inscription Celtic Beric. Celtic Beric, all right? Iberian Celtic, Celtic Iberian correlating with all the other findings here like, like in the book we read America BC and the other book in plain sight we're going to start reading more chapters of that all these inscriptions being found all over the Americas old world inscriptions so called old world this is the true old world so you got all these scholars letting you know hey this looks runic hey no this looks Celtic oh no no I think it looks more Celtic Beric Mr. Albert M. Tomlinson states in a letter above referred to that he commenced opening the mound on the 19th of March, 1838, that he wrote at the excavation himself, and that he found the first or lower vault on the 4th of April, and the second or upper vault on the 16th of June of that year, that the Oseos remains of two human skeletons in a state of decay were found in the first, one of which had 650 beads and a small joke shaped ornament or implement with two perforations. The other was without any ornament, whatever. That the upper vault contained the remains of but one skeleton and a great number of trinkets, the chief of which were 1,700 bone beads, 500 seashells, 150 pieces of mica, five copper wrists and armor bands, and a small flat stone of which he furnishes a facsimile. All right. This was all found with that skeleton. Very important person, most likely, right? This is uh, page 195. They said you can find this about three eighths of an inch thick with an engraving. Continue says Dr. Willis de Haas of Grave Creek has recently, 1850, brought to Washington the original stone, a facsimile of which is given by Captain S. Eastman. He has also copied its reverse. These drawings accurately correspond with the copy published by the American Ethnological Society in 1846. The same artist has also copied the ancient Celtic inscription before referred to. Also, a curious device found in one of the minor mounds at Grave Creek Flats and a circular stone without inscription, but identical in material with the inscription stone. These facts will enable the reader to form his own judgment in the matter. All right, so I want to show you guys what they have here. When they're saying figure one, figure five, four. All right. So here's the actual Grave Creek uh, tablet. As you guys can see, the runic and what they're saying, Celtic, Iberic, or Libyan. They all argue what it is. You know, this is the true old world. And this is a comparison, I believe, of what they were saying with the Celtic. This is what they're finding here. Celtic, Iberian characters in West Virginia. Grave Creek Flats appear to have been the site of an ancient Indian town of importance. Seven mounds or their remains still existed upon these flats in 1844. Although the plow and the spade had done much to obliterate the smaller ones, there were also traces of a large circular work embracing a part of the public road leading northeast to the hills. The relation of these several objects is shown by Plate 39. After crossing this low ground, there were also traces of circumvallation on the more elevated level grounds, and on rising the hills to Pars Point, there was still quite entire and undisturbed the ruins of a tower or lookout upon a commanding point of ground on the farm of Mr. Mitchell Tree. This work had been commenced by excavating the earth several feet and walling it up with rough stones in the manner of a well. From the quantity of fallen stones around and within this excavation, this tower must have been many feet above the ground. 
every one of those stones of which it is composed must have been carried up the acclivity for nearly a mile as the surface of the hills consists entirely of a loam and loose soil right they're talking about these ancient ruins that the uh, american indians had here this is before europeans got here continue says the inscription of this tumulus if it be true is foreign all right they're saying it's foreign because they look so much like the celtic right the question of its genuineness must rest on the veracity of mr tomlinson and his neighbors who have united in his statements on the score of its being of iberic origin the account of dr clemens who is the leaf favorable to the antiquity of the mound opposes no bar to a foreign theory given as his facts do the date of 1538 so uh this guy is saying that the spanish brought it right and then they buried it in the mound you know <laughs> a lot again a lot of people don't want to accept this is the true old world so he gives it uh the date of 1538 puts it 26 years after the discovery of Florida by De Leon and one year subsequent to the discovery of the mouth of the Mississippi by Narvaez. A stronger objection is found in the inability of the Copenhagen antiquarians to read it, while acknowledging a large portion of its characters to be in the Spanish type of the Celtic. The following characters are common, it will be seen, to the inscription at Dighton Rock and Grave Creek Mound, namely. All right, and they show you these ones. A still greater amount of resemblance to it appears in the stick book character of the ancient British Celtic. Ancient British Celtic, not just Spanish Celtic. This is perceived in the characters, all right? Look at that. Which are common to both inscriptions, namely the Celtic and the Virginic, the one in Virginia. Same. There would appear to be some grounds here for the Welsh tradition of Maddox. All right, remember Maddox, supposed to came here. We got a future video on all this. Who is Maddox? All right, we have those three inscriptions, which appear to have been made in the same mixed characters or to have something in common. Elements of an alphabet are seen, which were known to many nations of Western Europe and were originally derivative from the banks of the Mediterranean before the introduction of the Roman alphabet. So again, this is what they're finding in Virginia. All right, matching the ancient British Celtic. All right, so real quick, I just want to show you that they actually found another stone with similar inscriptions in the same area. It says, every fact relating to asserted inscriptions of an ancient date on this continent requires the closest scrutiny. But we are not at liberty to deny record to any well-attested report. All right? There he literally telling you, but if, hey, if the shoe fits, if they're finding this in the mound, you cannot deny it. All right? Any record with a well-attested report there was found in one of the group of minor mounds of the grave creek flats in the ohio valley a small globular stone about one inch and a half in diameter containing some devices which resembled those of the inscribed stone alleged to have been found by mr tomlinson all right so they actually found another stone which actually resembles what mr tomlinson found right the grave creek tablet a cast of this stone was presented to me in 1844 during a visit to that place by mr wills de has of which a copy with his inscriptive matter is given in plate 38, figure 4. The characters on this stone appear to be as follows. All right, you see that? All right, so this is what they're talking about right here. Okay. There is some eccentricity in the forms of the letters. The first is recognized on the Dighton Rock. Nothing is more demonstrable than that whatever has emanated in the graphic or inscriptive art on this continent from the Red Race does not aspire above the simple art of pictography and that wherever an alphabet of any kind is variable discovered it must have had a foreign origin by granting belief to anything contravening this state of art we at first deceive ourselves and then lend our influence to diffuse error oh that's deep right there so i just wanted to show you guys they finding these inscriptions in that same area all over the place that's why the museum the british museum has it that's why they're writing about it because they cannot prove it wrong this is the Smithsonian Annual Report, um, 1882, 1883. This is John Wesley um, Howell. This is an original copy. Um, John Wesley Howell in 1789. Again, this is uh, this is the I'm sorry, Powell. This is the director um, of uh, the Bureau of Ethnology at the Smithsonian Institute. He said this. Um, Artifacts found prior to Christopher Columbus's arrival would be considered illegitimate by the Smithsonian um, 
Only the savage Indian culture would be observed, and this created the artificial bar barrier to science. Only the savage. Science was colluding with government because of commerce and religion was involved. Now, why do I tell you all this stuff? Not because I'm an Indian expert or anything else. You've got to do your own homework. I, I just found out about this stuff. I'm amazed by it. I don't know what the answer is on this. Um, the, the history... The history that has been erased in our nation, and in particular with the Native Americans, happened because it didn't fit the story they created, Manifest Destiny. It only works when Indians were savages, and they had to have savages for commerce and government to expand. The ancient artifacts prove otherwise. Why aren't we looking into those?